I'm now going to uh, start the Q&A session. So let's please keep your questions quite precise or short comments. I'll, I'll take three at a time and we'll give um, the, a time for the panel to respond. So anybody has any questions? Somebody at the back, okay? And the gentleman in front. I would like to ask Sister Susela a question about Pan-Africanism. So after see how during the 60s, the African Revolution all over Africa were stopped by the imperialists. And I would like to ask if Pan-Africanism organized African people militarily as well. So, so what was that last bit? If Pan-Africanism think about organizing African people militarily as well. And the second question is, after seeing uh, the intervention of China in Nigeria, in the in trying to liberate 200 girls that we kidnapped by a terrorist group called Boko Haram, I would like to know what is the real intention of the Chinese in the African continent and what Pan Africans think about them. I get there's, yeah, there's a few questions sorry, sorry, in there, isn't there? there? I think that. Uh, um, I think your, your first point about um, Africans um, developing themselves militarily, um, that's something that's already happening. Mm -hmm. So we can talk about the African Union, for example, massive international military force. I don't think any other continent has a mm -hmm. national right. military force mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, so the potential is there, mm -hmm. but I think it goes back to the ideology. And I think what's happening is, um, what I found anyway, um, sort of working in education, is that actually um, the colonised mind um, almost seems more colonised on the continent than it does outside of the continent. Pan-Africanism is something that um, started actually outside of the continent and I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of decolonising um, ordinary African people's minds. You know, they start off with the same colonial education system yeah. that we have here, yeah. they have it there um, and I think sometimes it can actually be a lot more intense. Um, I think I'll, I'll give an example of a friend's mum. Um, I was talking to a friend's mum who grew up in the Caribbean, grew up in Jamaica, um, I don't know, about 40, 50 years ago, she would have been going to school. And what she said to me is she learned more about Britain and British geography um, than she did about what was going on in Jamaica on the island itself. Um, there was another part to your question, which is totally was, slipped me about the, China. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh! Personally, my personal opinion, um, I wouldn't necessarily think their intentions um, are necessarily good. Um, you know, it's about their own interests. China are looking out for their own interests, and I can't see. It's almost like a, I have to think about that one. You know, is the the better the devil, you know. You know, I, I'm I'm not sure what's going to happen with China. Um, when it comes to controlling resources um, as a Pan-African, um, I think it's really important that as Africans, we need to control those resources. If we're going to, if China's coming in, then we've got to be the ones that determine the level of their involvement. But like I said, I think there's a lot of colonization that's been going on, a lot of colonize, colonizing of the mind. Um, so we're not actually in a position to determine the nature of that relationship with China. I don't know if that answers your question. So Carla would like to come in. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I'd like to politely disagree that Africans on the continent are more colonised than those of us outside of it. I think that, I don't want to get into this, we're better than them hierarchy. I think yeah. if you gave most of us who don't have to run a country, a country to run, you'd see just how colonised we are <laughs> and just how much we worship Europeans. I think unfortunately for brothers and sisters on the continent, they do have that task of actually running countries rather than being the recipients of frankly, in some cases, European charity, like those of us that live in the West and in America are. So I don't think it's that, that, that anyone's more colonised. If anything, I would say brothers and sisters on the continent are more militant, and that's why the pushback against them is harder. I'm going by experience because I have students that come over from the continent and they come to university. And when I but who's being them, chosen? Do you see what I'm saying? True, so if I pick, true, if true, I pick true, from... True, if, I, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm an elite university, true. if I'm Harvard, I'm not going to pick the most radical youth from Jamaica to come True. and study at Harvard. I'm going to pick who I can control. Yeah. And so the likelihood is those Africans, yes, that get picked for specific scholarships for specific purposes. But if we're on the ground in Azania, South Africa, if we're on the yeah. ground in Kinshasa and elsewhere, Jamaica has just as many churches worshipping a white Jesus as any place in Africa. 
So I don't think we're, 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 we're more or less. I think that with China, I think that the, the, the jury is out. And what I'll say is this, I think it's easy. Again, our, our worship of Europeans means that anytime anyone else steps in, we're more weary of them than we are of the very yes. people who've been killing us for 500 years. It's amazing. Yeah. We'd rather stick to the people who've, who've proven what they're about and say, you know what? But it's our historical ignorance and our lack of understanding of our own history that feeds this. Was Africa some insular place that wasn't trading with nowhere across the world before Europeans arrived? No, it was not. We were trading with the Middle East, we were trading with India. The, the famous Damascus swords, where was the steel made? In Africa. So they're referred to as Damascus swords. There was globalization before Europeans came along. The Chinese were, were in East Africa. They were sent, uh, Admiral Zheng, he was sent a giraffe. He came to East Africa, he bought, a, he bought a giraffe and he went back home. So we have a historical relationship. Chinese people are humans. That means there's Chinese people that are capable of being absolute lunatics and Chinese people that are capable of being wonderful. But my view, to be honest with you, as much as it might upset some people, is China doesn't owe Africa anything. China did not put Africa in the position it's in. The African elite, Arab imperialism and European imperialism put Africa where it is. If African governments do not negotiate the best deals for their people, there are not Chinese military bases forcing them to sell off their resources cheaply, like there is with Americans and others. What is a Chinese businessman supposed to say? Oh, well, you know, all this Colton and diamonds, I don't really want it. You know, you keep it, you know, they've got people to feed too. You're, you're an individual, right? If you're on the block and someone says to you, here's 500 pounds, well, you, you're, gonna give, you're gonna give it back? So I'm just saying that I think the, the owner is sometimes on the wrong foot. That doesn't mean we should romanticize what's going on, and I agree completely. Africans need to control their own resources and their own development, have an agenda for their relationship with China, and the better African governments seem to have that. Who built the military base in the north of Zimbabwe? Which is maybe one of the reasons Zimbabwe didn't get dealt with like other countries. It was a relationship. Zimbabwe said, we'll sell you X amount of diamonds, and you build us what we want. Thank you. We'll move to the next question. Sorry. Yes, gentlemen, there's one. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, a question for Akala uh, regarding propaganda, this and the other, especially yeah. with the youth and with music. Um, in, in regards to turning the whole thing around, this really sounds pessimistic, but I think in this day and age, with the over, overtly hypersexualized media, it's really not possible. If you, if you look at the artists yeah. that are being played on the radios, they're either one, white, Two, good looking, and three, if they are black, they are like they are lighter in the skin color. For example, Drake, right? Now I know a lot of black youths in my, in my school. That's the area, right? And they're all quoting constantly Drake and J Cole. They don't, they, they forget use, uh, Wu Tang, and they don't listen to Jimi Hendrix. They have no clue who Jimi Hendrix is. And because they're so influenced by these people, and they're influenced by their lifestyle, they want to achieve that lifestyle, um, and, and and completely forget about you know uh, what is truly important. So in that respect, with the youth captivated by these sort of people, it's going to be completely impossible, almost completely impossible, for this generation to turn around, and also quickly of course they can. Um, with ISIS taking over Mosul, Tikrit, and Fallujah in a matter of five months, and with Maliki and um, the America inferring that they're going to um, have some sort of um, joint strikes with Iran to combat ISIS, uh, what's really the what's the sort of background narrative here? I'll take next question. There was a gentleman here. Yes, go ahead. I was wondering, this is open to the whole panel. Yeah. I was wondering if you believe that, um, my son a bit rather a little bit crazy, but if you believe that the reason that Obama was elected is so that uh, America can get into Africa. Because I really believe with the whole African thing, the whole thing, it was sort of set up. And, and also without our own, say our own, uh, a media, medium for people, be it radio, be it social media, whatever that is, large and not shut down and not controlled. How, how are we able to sort of talk about all of the issues here today and get them out to all of the all of the younger people who are quoting Drake and talking stupidness about Beyonce? Because we really don't care about that. Okay. Any more questions? Yep. Yeah, my, my question is uh, about what Carlos was talking about with academics being. Um, my question is actually, it's about critical whiteness. Um, I came across this uh, course actually when I was in Berlin and a lot of Methodist people, they like to include, include this in their discourse and it's kind of almost like a, a right to passage which has somehow been distorted because it's like, once you do a critical whiteness course, you can somehow say then, well, you know, I also volunteer at refugee uh, solidarity events and stuff like this. 
And um, I basically wanted to ask how much stock you put in forces like this and how much value you would say it gives to the discussion about race. Because for me, sometimes when I look at it, it's almost as, a, as if it's a way, a structure that's been built to allow people to absorb white guilt. So, um, and also it brings up the idea of this whole course of, I don't know if, you, if anyone remembers the doctor's name, but um, she did this course of blue eyes and brown eyes yeah. or something like that. And Jane Elliott. Jane Elliott, thank you. And it brings up this kind of concept as well, as how much value is in something like this, if people are going to take it in this kind of um, angry way and then not actually think about it. So. Okay. Can I just quickly add something about the, the, the machine that I was talking about? When we do have an artist that does come out, such as Loki, the house gets raided and they get shut down completely. That shows that how sort of powerless and how powerful the machine is. So, you know. um, I, I, I don't, I, I don't think there's. Should I answer that one first? Yes, please, there's no please. reason for despair, in my opinion. It isn't impossible. Slavery wasn't supposed to end. African countries weren't supposed to get the limited amount of independence they have. The bigger struggles than what you're talking about have been fought. If Malcolm X died when he was 25, as people always point out, because a lot of people like to diss Tupac, who in my opinion was a revolutionary in the making, but had his contradictions. Yeah. Who am I to judge Tupac? If you listen to my early music, clearly I had my own contradictions too. If Malcolm X died at 25, what would he have been? A drug dealer? You know, a, a man who pimps women, etc. All of the things that we know Malcolm was at 25. What propaganda caught Malcolm's ear? That I like... I write, I perform, I'm very thankful to be here today and for all the events that I go to where you're surrounded, you're in a room full of like-minded people. Um, one thing, a problem I was discussing with another artist the other day was that we go to these events and everybody who's there is already of that mindset. So we all do our thing, we, we perform, we talk, yeah, I love your work, blah, 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 whatever, and then we all go home. We might talk about it to our family, our friends, who are all of the same mindset. How do we now take the message outside of this circle? Okay. Yes. Yeah, uh, it's a question directed to Carla. Um, oh yeah, this is a question directed to Carla. Um, I've read some critics, uh, uh, some criticisms of uh, white or privileged theory as a whole. And, uh, one criticism is that white like pointing out that white people are privileged isn't like so much like an aha moment it's like should be obvious right it, it might not be obvious to white people but it's obvious to everyone else right um and sh is it more important to fight white supremacy as a system and organize against it rather than like focusing all our energy on like pointing out that you know white people are privileged okay so the first one it's about NATO and if we plan anything um, to oppose them in August. So who would like to come to that? Well, just, on, just on, as I said uh, previously, listen, we had the anti, you know, those of us who were there 2003 on the march, right? But frankly, everything in the West, and this is, this is Malcolm X's point. He says, if the homeland is not free, we're not going to be free. Homeland is fighting. Yeah. Are we going to support it or not? Simple as. Mm -hmm. Homeland is rolling on all, sorry, the West, the so-called West, is rolling on all of our countries. It's rolling on CARICOM, it's rolling on ALBA, it's rolling on the African Union, it's rolling on the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and it's rolling on South Asia. Where have the forces been? I'm just gonna finish off on this. Just this question to you, really think it through. Where has the forces been overwhelmingly that has fought white supremacy and colonialism and neocolonialism? Is it in the West or is it in the majority of humanity which is in the non-West? The answer is obvious and that's what we should be developing our understanding and understanding the contradictions because there's many contradictions there but you know we all have contradictions I'm not going to sell out my mum and dad because they treated me unfairly sometimes they're my mum and dad at the end of the day they birthed me they grew me they made me who I am today and I will always be internally loyal to them using that analogy you know, the fathers and mothers of our nation and of our struggles that continue. I'm not going to sell them out just because they did, because they didn't do what I think they should have done sitting here in London, not dealing with any of their complexities. Of, I'm just not going to do that. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. They've sacrificed in their millions, right? We want to cuss out Zuma for having a swimming pool. Did you see how the elites in this country live? He was, mm -hmm. We're cussing out Zuma for having a swimming pool. You try spending 10 years in a prison getting tortured every day going underground in Umkunta in Sizwe. 
until we achieve what these people have achieved. Shut up. Okay. Hmm? Sorry? That's fine. <laughs> Next one, Akala, was about the role of artists to take this message, but outside the circles, people who are already you know, aware. What do yeah. you do? Outside Following on from what, what sure. Brother Bro Sikhan said, though, as well, I think that, that said, people living in many of these countries also have the right, and sadly, many of our people who are not revolutionary and lean, and this idea that all our people are wonderful is obviously not true. And many of our people make it easy for themselves to be demonized, but also make it easy for their own populations to hate them. Yeah. You know, even I, I was in Jamaica last week, you know, for all of the money Bob Marley has generated for that country, Trenchtown looks exactly as it did 40 years ago. You know the only thing they painted in Trenchtown? The yard where Bob Marley grew up. Mm. I'm not saying this to be horrible, to poo-poo the Caribbean, etc. But you're making it very easy for the people of Trenchtown to be severely pissed off and hate you when this man's image creates billions and billions of dollars in wealth mm -hmm. for the country and the neighborhood, even the theaters, everything exactly as it was 34 years ago. And so there are legitimate frustrations people can also have with their own leadership that make it much easier for those frustrations to be exploited. So yeah. I think there's space for criticism, but it's what our criticism is intended for and who it's to and things like that. In terms of what, what you said, I think that's absolutely correct. I mean, the privilege calling in the show, whatever. I just, I don't really waste time talking to white people about racism most of the time. And I'm not saying that to be horrible. It's because if you want to know, ask me a question. But there's no point me saying to you, you know, you inherit block because many of our own people, A, don't give a shit and B, as, as was said earlier, the amount of melanin in your skin doesn't mean you're going to be loyal to this particular ideology. It wasn't, you know, if you look at many of our leaders that have been killed, who was it who killed them? They've got people that look just yeah. like them, not offering their right hand man to murder them. So yeah, clearly yeah. your morality isn't in your melanin, right? That doesn't mean, I'm, and I'm not saying that the way lefties say it, oh, we're all the same, blah, blah, blah. I don't mean it in that sense. I mean it in the sense that you're absolutely right. The system of white supremacy in individual white people is, is not exactly the same. And yeah. if someone genuinely is, has revolutionary leans and wants to engage in something, or if someone like Tim Wise exists, and he wants to do what clearly the, all of us who are brown have not been able to achieve, and that's educate white people about white supremacy, good luck to him, right? <laughs> why, why should we oppose him? He's trying to take on a task that we have clearly haven't been successful at. Um, but as long as we don't start to get into this savior mm. industry it's where we view these people as our voices, they're not our voices, how could they ever be our voices? They're not. Um, with the artist um, scenario, I don't know, I was one of those people that didn't want to listen to all this stuff. And I went to Pan-African Saturday School. My favorite rap groups when I was a kid were Mob Deep and DMX. So this idea that there's these guys out there and us conscious people over here, I'm sure many people in this room can speak to this. I'm sure my brother Shaku asked a brilliant question earlier today and someone I dialogue with about politics all the time. If he was to speak about his upbringing in Chapel Town in Leeds and the things that he went through, etc., you're not seeing before you, the man that you see today is not the teenager you saw 10 years ago. So it's just hard work and we shouldn't be afraid of hard work, but we are pulling people in. Billions and billions are spent bombarding them with these images. Yeah. Billions are not spent on artists like yourself and others. And so of course it's going to be a struggle. But I don't think we're in a room always with like-minded people. I think people have evolved to the position that they're in now. And some of the people who are in this room in 10 years might go completely the other way. But do you feel like sometimes, well, one thing that I struggle with sometimes is the tone of things. The way they're written is actually quite abrasive sometimes. Right? I, a lot of people write about things they feel strongly about. But one of the challenges is to make it accessible people and not make yourself sound like I'm angry and I'm militant and I'm, you're not going to want to talk to me. It's, it's about like, I don't know, how can we even empower other young people, sorry, I'm not like asking another question, just like elaborating on the original question, just to like, what, I don't know, do you have any advice for like younger people maybe who aren't as mindful about their tone and the way they carry themselves or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to say just, just a few seconds, I mean, it may not be very popular, no surprise, I'm Sagan. Um, <laughs> quoting Dead Press, turn off the radio. Why not just turn all this shit off? Mm. It's just profoundly permeated mm. with misogyny, yeah. internalized white supremacy, violence and destructiveness. Some of you who are here for the first half an hour, 2.30 to 3, we had a CD by Abida Parveen, a Sufi singer from... Uh, uh, Pakistan, former uh, undivided India, sings in Punjabi, sings in different languages in Urdu, and is in so, we have cultures. It's not all hip hop. I'm sorry to say, <laughs> yeah. you know, I'm really sorry to say. Why is the conversation always dominated by, by hip hop or grime or R and B? We have, you know, you listen to that stuff and it liberates your soul. 
I, I listen to I listen to any of I listen to listen. This is just me, my personal point, right? I listen to Imtech. It just it horribly it makes me horrible feel horrible. I'm like, just turn that. Where's Nusrat? <laughs> Get Nusrat on quickly. <laughs> you know what I'm saying is that listen, listen. It's not all about hip hop. We have so many cultures and uh, and music forms of humanity that is not defined from the from the so-called entertainment industry. It's not. It's an oppressive industry, you, using and abusing and hustling on and pimping out our black revolutionary culture to internalize and oppress us back into the system. Just switch that off. Why don't we engage in? Why don't we encourage our younger people to engage in that? Is what is healthy for their minds and their souls. I don't understand this personally. Yeah. The sister's question still stands because yeah. our young people are not listening. Sadly, yeah. we're not even listening to reggae, which was a form of music that sold billions and billions of units. Let alone some of the cultures you mentioned, as, as valid as they are, and. Um, I, I, I don't think being aggressive isn't the problem. I was attracted to aggression as a young man, and I know most young youths in the hood. The, uh, the reason Wu Tang got through to me and Dead Prez got through to me, and other conscious artists didn't, no disrespect to them, is because I thought they were soft. I'll be honest with you, and I thought Wu Tang were hard. So I was like, I'll listen to what they got to say, because I think they're hard. So I think there's a place for that aggression. But sadly, the other thing is materialism. You know, I went through a phase in 2010 when I dressed like a hippie and I didn't cut my hair and I didn't care what I wore and I went into schools, and I saw how youths looked at me. I drive a nice car, dress a bit better now, and I see how you look at me now. If you look broke in hip hop, and in our, they don't want to hear you. So you, there's this balance of having your politics and your beliefs, but showing enough that you're like, I'm not a mug, and I'm not like this broke, horrible artist that no one wants to be, because people want to look up to someone they want to be like. Yeah. And so it's a constant dialogue. One of the reasons Garvey was such a great propagandist, and I'll leave you on this, is even though he didn't steal the people's money, he always made sure he looked fresh that he looked presentable, that people wanted to be like Marcus Garvey, even though he was, and it was a propaganda game. He was very clear about that, even if he dressed in the clothes of an English duke, because mm. that's where our people were at at that time. Mm. And so we've got to be able to engage on many different levels and speak in many different levels. If we try and come at them with some kind of hippie, flowery, you know, kind of stuff that they're just not going to get, and I wouldn't have got when I was 15, then we're going to struggle. So I think we've got to, I don't know, Go ahead, mm. work on multiple levels. Uh, yeah, I wanted to come back on a couple of the questions that we've had around how do we turn the culture around? How do we get youth culture to get these ideas a little bit further than they are? And um, I mean, my son, my oldest son just turned 11. He says he's in year six, he's going to be going to high school, um, high school in Tottenham in September. And you can see the way global mass media, the amount of control that it has over kids thinking more than it ever has. Like we're in a very unique place in, 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 in society and history in a sense that community has been almost completely broken down. You used to get your ideas, your ideology, your thinking, your attitudes towards things. You would you would inherit the, like you would get them through your through your parents, your aunties, your uncles, your wider family, your community. Um, but that's been broken down and what's coming in its place is the global mass media first in the form of radio, then in the form of the television, then in the form of now in the form of YouTube and social networks and whatever else. So it's like, I, I see like my, my son's friends and it's like the system has got a petrol pump directly attached to their ears and it's just pumping the bullshit in and there's nothing to stop it. Do you know what I mean? I've got, like my son's friends, they got Xboxes in their bedrooms. They play Call of Duty. They play GTA like stuff I wouldn't let myself play yeah. they're playing it and they're, they're 11 very impressionable age do you know what I mean and so they've, they're building up these ideas around what their culture is and it's about individualism it's highly misogynistic highly imperialistic it's highly racist I mean I, I've seen people I never played Call of Duty myself but it seems to yeah. be they should just call it shoot the brown guy yeah mm, exactly <laughs> um so that, that's, that's the power that the global mass media has got. And there's, there's two aspects to how we solve that problem. And it's, it's not a small thing. One, at the small level, we need to do what, whatever we can. For, for me as a parent, it's quite an obvious thing. What I have to do is to, to break that power that the global mass media has on people's heads. To, as Sukhan said, so basically separate from it mm -hmm. and provide alternatives. alternatives e yeah. Even little alternatives can make a big difference to quite a few people's mm -hmm. lives. Akala had, um, as you described before, 
Pan-African Saturday School. We need more things like that. So at the very least, even if it doesn't impact you right then when you're seven or 10 or 13, you've got another ideology, another attitude, another way of thinking uh, that, you can, that you can draw on as you come to think about these things in your life. And, and Chuck D always says, uh, Chuck D, the, the lead rapper of Public Enemy, I'm sure you all know, yeah. he always said, the thing that saved us was that people like uh, Mofeni Asante, who's a major Pan-Africanist thinker, um, he was at university in New York putting on weekend schools, Saturday schools that people like Chuck D and people around were going to. And that created an, a knowledge and passion with, within them that they were able to use rap as a means to educate millions of people. Uh, so that's the, the smallest level. The wider scale level is we also need to compete in mm -hmm. the global mass media space. We can't, you know, that space is there and it's not going, realistically, it's not going away. Yeah. We're not going to ban YouTube. We're not mm -hmm. going to ban the internet. We're not going to ban television. Um, and let's face it, these things actually have uses and, and, and things that we can progressively use them for as well. So we need to compete in that space mm -hmm. and not leave it to the enemy. Yeah. I think Russia are starting to, to do that and starting to professionalize in that with Russia today. Mm -hmm. Iranians Press are doing TV. well with Press TV. Press TV. Um, the Latin Americans are stepping up their game. Um, with Telesur, Chinese are starting to get involved. So on the wider scale, strategically, we should be helping out with all of that, being open to that, promoting it, assisting in any way that we can with that, yeah. and just celebrating it as like, yeah, we're gonna take that space back. We're not yeah. gonna leave it to, yeah. to corporations, to the US, to Britain, to imperialism, to white supremacy. Can I give you one quick example following off what you said? It's literally 30 seconds. When I was in Morocco, I found that, and I'm not saying it's ne necessarily positive because it's South Korea, right? Yeah. But South Korea, has television soaps that they've translated into Dirija. Yeah. That are the most popular television soaps in Morocco, yeah. right? If anyone's from Morocco here, we're in Labrador, you'd be able to tell me, right? <laughs> now, South Korea now has a certain amount of soft power in Morocco just from mm. that. Now, why aren't other states, particularly revolutionary states, just mm. engaging in that? that. Yeah. Random. South Korea and Morocco, who would have yeah. thought, right? Exactly. But that's the kind of inventive creativity that's got to be yeah. involved. Yeah. Um, Sister Azu, would you like to come in? Um, two things. One, I want to address what you were saying. Because I think, although there's been lots of good examples here, I think there is a very, very big fundamental problem that she's highlighted, and we are we are really struggling with it. You know? yeah. I'll, I'll address what you said about turning the set off in a minute using my own example. But whoever it was, I think over here who asked something or about Obama being elected mm -hmm. because it justified a kind of a, a intervention, intervention in, in Africa. Africa. I think just to widen that out, it wasn't a, an African or an African diaspora audience only for that you know mm. it sure. spoke to the whole world for and sure. it, mm. yeah. you know it seemed yeah. to be the proof that the West had got it sorted in a post-racial yeah. society yeah. I yeah. travel a lot yeah. everywhere I go yeah. whether it was Malaysia Indonesia Iran you name it it was wow look brilliant you know some and actually because someone like us mm. can be the head of that state that's the place you know yeah. and it wiped out it eradicated all of that mm. critique mm. Yeah. Yeah. as built up in all these different traditions of what America is not because we are obsessed about America but because that is the foundational example that exists today of what has gone wrong in the last 500 years of a usurpation of land right cultures everything of the rest of the world not just a usurpation a destruction of everything else that's an alternative so that message is so incredibly powerful we're still living the <laughs> globally the destruction of it and you know how to get around that I don't know I just wanted to widen it out this is a Mm. stage, you know, the stage was the world. Mm. Just going back to what the sister said at the back here, and uh, before I had kids, and when I had stepkids as well, I was very much into the, just turn the TV off, okay, mm -hmm. because I also wanted to make sure that there wasn't that kind of poison that was, a, that was around me when I was growing up. I grew up in a very kind of isolated uh, experience as a quote-unquote ethnic minority or black person in the north of London. And it worked for a bit, but ultimately you can't block it out. Yeah. You cannot block it out. We just really don't have enough viable alternatives. So I'm going to be honest. I'm not, you know, I'm from South Asian heritage. There isn't a single CD or anything in my house on my phone. So can't you work with me? You know what's on my ringtones, right? Okay. It's really depressing. There's so nothing yeah. there even for me yeah. um, that I can convey to my kids, yeah. okay? And we do need to solve this because, you know, yeah. when I write, I am the angry woman and I do have an audience, but it's not for everyone. In fact, it's probably not for most people. Yeah. 
Now, you know, it's easy for me to sit here and go, oh, we need to share examples and blah, 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 but we do need to do something, and it's drastic, yeah. because that soft power that you're talking about, it's intense, and I don't really see in the near future there are going to be Iranian soap operas going around the world. There are Turkish, and that's not really a solution, because they're not particularly <laughs> the method that we want to go around. It's just replicating yeah. the soap opera format, which is in itself a format which is incredibly problematic. You know? yeah. So it's it's just feeding a need for a certain type of drama which is destructive for all communities, you know, and just changing the, the nature of the people who are making the dramas is not necessarily sorry, not to obsess on that point, no, but you know, yeah. sure. um, it's not necessarily gonna help. There are sort of deep cultural problems that we need to kind of tackle mm. and tackle urgently. How I don't know, but I do think what you're saying is really very important. Okay. It is one of the, the things we have to flag up. It's you know, we are a lot of angry people and good writers and good artists and all the rest of it but it's it's just one facet and it's not even appealing necessarily to our own children mm -hmm. and, uh, wider, the wider populace there was a question young gentleman in red yeah i want to thank all of you for giving us this opportunity for your contributions um and i think you've got quite a diverse panel there so i want you to all if you don't mind respond uh, to this one um i think Divide and rules become, you know, a really popular phrase now, and I think some divides are obviously imposed on us. But some are, you know, created by ourselves. So I want to represent my ends, I want to, you know, my fam, whatever, or even my religion to continue the theme of ideology. Um, how relevant do we think religion is uh, to world peace today? Is it a force for peace or is it a force for war? That's a big question. Next one. Will be next story. Go ahead, Susan. Hi, um, my question is, uh, it's a bit more ended but basically what I want to know is do we need to be more radicalised? I don't mean in like sort of an extremist fundamentalist way, but for example, all the um, revolution, all the revolts that we've seen being successful has always been that the group of people have done something unexpected. The reason why um, Gandhi's uh, movement worked was because British shouldn't expect anyone to come out with a passive non-violent movement. They wanted people to go and revolt and um, you know, be, be violent. The reason why I feel that the Arab Springs work, um, I know I think most can say it was more a revolt than a revolution as such, but the reason why they work was because, again, no one was expecting it. Um, no one was expecting this furor, this anger to sort of like rise in such a way across across North Africa and the Middle East. So I just I just kind of feel that we're at a point now where I'm I'm really disenchanted. I, I don't know. I mean I can be here in this sphere and with like-minded people and, and and be like right okay you know we need to do this. But the moment I step out of it, there's so much moving against me. And to give a personal example, during. The Arab Springs. I was doing a lot of critical analysis, a lot of uh, blogging, but at the same time, I was doing missile aerodynamics for my degree, and you know, I was sponsored by MBDA. Next thing you know, I'm in my supervisor's office, going, "What? What is it that you're doing?" Like I didn't even know he could research the first place he could, and you know, so that was sort of like, okay, it's either your degree or you do this. So since then, I've been sort of like, right, okay, I'm going to stay clear right. of all this. But how do you sort of, I guess, in a way? Um, how do you resolve your personal interests with like the wider community, the wider world? How do you go about and actually make a difference? Okay. Hi, yeah. Um, I know we've touched a bit on this, but sectarianism <coughs> is a serious problem, at least in the Muslim community. Um, almost this idea of conditioning for self-hate. Um, so I want you to someone to touch on that on the panel. Um, it's, it's something that's growing from, to the point that even in, in, in my community where I'm from, from Bradford, in certain areas, certain people won't go to a certain mosque because that, that's always at play. And is that a tool that's being used at the moment by, or as a tool like for psych, psych people too? Is that something that's being used as a tool? Okay, so the first question was about religion, the role of religion in building peace. Does it really contribute to it or <laughs> does it divide us more? Uh, next one is about how to reconcile your personal interests with, you know, revolutionary thinking and, and, and act. And sectarianism in the Muslim community. How do we deal with that, please? Who would like to come first? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Just play that way. 
<laughs> Too late. <laughs> okay. You know, actually, we've just actually published, well, not just, about two or three months ago, published a paper that touches on the question you raised uh, for a couple of reasons. One is some, some of the work of IHRC, which you won't see on our website, is to do with uh, trying to use an alternative phrase, but the one that everyone uses is conflict resolution in various uh, situations. So we're doing stuff on Pakistan and Indonesia and Malaysia and so on. Uh, and one of the things that we picked up on was the kind of overwhelming literature that keeps flagging up the idea of religion being problematic. Okay. Now, from our point of view and the kind of work that we've worked around, I think we have to be clear that, yes, there are certain things which essentially translate into nationalism, and religion can be one of them. Okay? It's about creating an exclusive idea of yourself. And the process of that is very damaging. So you can call yourself a Muslim, a Christian, or whatever, and commit heinous acts and war, etc., 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 because of that. But our argument is that that is not religion or uh, faith, if you like, in that sense, because religion is also a word that's coming from a Eurocentric lexicon, okay, to describe faith systems or ide ideologies or however else we want to describe them, okay. <coughs> and using a kind of lens of Europe to view how everybody else works in the world and how they, what they believe and how they practice and how they live. Religion can be or faith, or you know, whether it's Islam, Christianity, uh, other faiths which don't get all that kind of publicity, you know, the ones that are called uh, indigenous or animistic or whatever, right? They have all these labels that are coming really from places outside of our control. Mm -hmm. When they provide a, uh, a motor for change, transformative change, can only be a good thing. It doesn't matter where the impetus for you to want a better mm -hmm. world comes from. As long yeah. as it does not fall into that categorization of, okay, it's a better world for me because I'm better than you because I'm X, Y, or Z, yeah. okay, it's fine, it's good. And I think we've had a lot of positive examples of that over these decades in history, however you want to view it. It's not to say that people can't go around and say I'm X and Y using a religious narrative and, you know, create havoc and, mm -hmm. and violence and whatever. We're just seeing, seeing it in Iraq right now. When I was speaking to a friend who's complete, you know, who's coming from a Shia Muslim background in Iraq, saying I read the speech of the ISIS guy, and you know, until he starts going on about killing Shias, to be honest, it's quite a nice speech because you know he's talking about, you know, the the benefit and the victory, and you know, wanting to change things. And if you go to Mosul right now, people who don't have infrastructure are getting food, free food, and petrol, and all sorts of stuff. You know, all that's good. The problem is, it's a narrow narrative just for X community, you know, and it's mm. excluding everybody else. So, you know, a religious motivation that actually was wanting that for everybody would be great. The fact that it's kind of exclusively done to the group that is okay, that is, the you know, the saved community. A is replicating something that's been going on in Europe for 500 years and projecting everywhere else, which is deeply problematic. And B is just plain wrong and immoral and we can't have that. So that's my long-winded way around of saying, actually, I think religion can be a very good thing and can contribute to peace. And we've had the examples everywhere. And we need to focus on that, because if that's what a person's saying is driving them, and you can see the intention is there from the impact, we mm. shouldn't be demonizing, we shouldn't be falling into the trap of demonizing that. We need to work out what is it that we are criticizing. Mm. And that is the structures that create violence. Mm. Okay. What was the second thing, sectarianism? Yeah, so within the Muslim community. Do you want to do everyone answer one at a time? Or just yeah. yeah, go ahead. Do you want me to? No, you can respond. Yeah, you can carry on. Thank I think you. sectarianism is another way of creating. You know, it's another nationalism. Okay? It's another way of people self-defining, which is coming from. Uh, I don't. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Can I just be like, no, no offense. If I sit this way and try and project, is that? And then yeah. if I really, you can't. I'll stand up. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay. So sectarianism, essentially. Um, Again, the Shia, Sunni, whatever, it's Protestant, Catholic, all these kind of labels are again replicating a form of nationalism. And that nationalism comes from a very European heritage. When you look at the globalized world outside of this last 500 years of sort of hegemonic European takeover, it was quite globalized. People had their identities, but they had multiple identities. They had crossover. They had, you know, we were talking about trade between Africa and the rest of the world and China and here and there and everywhere continuing okay and it was done in a way that people were interacting with each other without that kind of thing I'm not trying to kind of make it a wonderful glorious golden past without problems but you know you did have a kind of interaction that you don't have now that's so heavily loaded 
with inequality. And part of the reason of that inequality is this mindset that we keep replicating about being a nation. A nation is a very specific kind of European concept about supremacy. Okay? And there are some sort of nations which will band together and create a wider sense of supremacy. And we keep getting stuck into the bind that if we keep you know, having an identity like that, somehow we are getting out of the mess that we're in. Actually, all we're doing is replicating, replicating. a faulty methodology. Yeah. We need to find a way of having our identities without being sort of dragged into this idea of supremacy. You know, that's one of the challenges we're always facing. So that sectarianism, I think, is coming out. Yes, it is a divide and rule tactic. But we are falling into it like you know, Muppets, frankly. We're just replicating. Mm. We're not seeing beyond, not just the sense of let's be Shias and Sunnis and Salafis and Sufis and whatever united, but let's get even beyond those borders. You know, that was actually the message of the Khomeini, which is that you know, we are all together. And if you see the revolutionary art of the late 70s and early 80s, it was about a kind of united global struggle against a system that was just depriving everybody and inflicting gross harm. Go ahead, yeah, just uh, the, the brother's got his hand up just to let you know. Um, just on the, on the religion issue, yeah, just to really re reiterate what Arzu said, I'm pretty much in agreement with everything she said. I, I consider myself a religious person, although what comes out of my mouth politically in, in analysis may not seem religious to you, but I'm very much informed by different faiths and their teachings uh, in a pro humanity type of perspective. And I believe actually most of the major faiths are in that orientation. Where it becomes problematic is when powers get involved, when oppressive powers get involved. And, and the most oppressive power and the most, most conniving, slick, sophisticated power on the planet is really, it is still the power emanating from this entity called London, which by, by the way, because of its nature, is the most parasitic place on the planet. Every trauma and conflict, London benefits. That's just the fact. When money rushes away from a, a place of conflict, where does it, a lot of it and end up? In London. So anyway, that aside, I mean, so really, what I'm saying is that religion is positive, but religion which is promoted by London, Paris and Washington is obviously going to be in line with the interests of London, Paris and Washington. And that's a very sophisticated process that they're in. So they say Al-Qaeda is the big enemy, but then they ally it with Al-Qaeda in Syria and Libya and other places. Mm. So they have a very sophisticated uh, strategy here that needs to be deconstructed and un uh, uh, understood. That doesn't mean, actually, that everyone pro-Al-Qaeda is necessarily totally bad. Because, frankly, I was soft on Al-Qaeda for a while when I thought they were problematic, but, uh, but a problematic, messed up response to oppression coming from the West. Let's give them a chance. Libya, Syria, Mali, nah. <laughs> They're not that. Just, and the other thing about the personal political, listen, and, and to, 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 to reference socialism outside the Eurocentric framework, there's Ubuntu in Southern Africa, mm -hmm. right? There's Seva amongst Punjabis, and P Punjabi speaking possibly in Kashmir and some other languages. You know what Seva means. Seva means serving the people, right? We have a concept, uh, concept in Islam called Shura, which means consensus, mm. right? So th there are obviously, there's concepts that we all have back home that we can develop if we don't like the word socialism and you don't like well, some, of the, some, some of the Eurocentric thing that comes from Marxism and socialism, that's fine. But the personal political is this, are we serving the people? Do we have that ethic? There's a quote from AZ in, in Life Say B in the Nas song from the first Illmatic album where he says, back in the, back in the 80s in the hoods we were all five percenters but something must got in us because we all turn to sinners. So what happened from the serve the people culture that we had of yesteryear to the take, 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 instant gratification, me, me, me culture now? You know, in Islam they say the greatest jihad is the inner jihad. Mm -hmm. And that's universally true. The greatest jihad we have, the greatest striving of struggle that we have is within ourselves in overcoming the system internalization that we're all suffering from. Mm -hmm. And to make that concrete, are we building capacity in our struggle? Yes or no? Are we? We've set up the Asata Tupac Liberation School from last October before we even set up the movement. Because we didn't want to say, hey, we're the movement, join us. People could rightly say, well, who are you? What you done? Mm. You know, so, so we said before we launched the movement, let's do initiatives and provide free spaces. Mm. The next course is starting in um, October this year in central London. There's a leaflet here that you've all got that, that, that you can check, um, be in touch with us with. Are we building? Yes, we need to feed our children. We need to feed our families. We need to have a... A, 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 a sure basis for our struggle. 
But beyond that, and as well as important as that, and maybe more important than that, I mean, do that, but more important than that is serving the struggle. Are we building institutions for our people? Are we doing the work for the global struggle? Are we dead? I mean, there's, a, there's 120 people in this room, roughly, right? Everyone is very engaged in a very serious strategical and tactical and ideological debate. Can we turn even 10% of that, of people, into working together from here? Mm. I hope so. From my experience, it doesn't happen, mm. of, of nearly 20 years of organizing experience. That is the jihad. That is the radicalization. That is the struggle. For us to gather, what it says in the Quran, God made people into different tribes for you to get to know each other. Mm. Are we getting to know each other and build our struggle? Thank you. Would you like to come in? Or no? Not particularly. Okay. Go on. Thank Alice? you. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll talk about religion and sectarianism a little bit. I, I think they're obviously kind of quite, linked. quite, quite linked mm -hmm. um, issues. Also, we're running out of time. Also, a lot of things have been said, mm -hmm. and also these are very you know, uh, divisive and very sensitive, fragile issues. That I don't want to, you know, uh, paint in very bro bro broad strokes and 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 step on people's toes. I think, um, like, we we need to separate religious ethics and religious morality from the structures that are sometimes built around religion and linked with money and with power and 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 frankly abuse by by the powers that be um yeah i'm not i'm not a religious person but i do think there's a reason that every single culture in the history of the world has had a religion has had a, a morality a set of ethics that bind them as a community that obviously serves a, a, a survival purpose for us as human beings mm -hmm. and and all the you know the religions have all got their different texts and their different rules and we tend to focus on on the differences but actually there's an awful lot of commonality in between yeah. religions if you talk about just a simple basic human value system a simple human ethic of looking out for each other yeah. taking care of our families um, emphasizing the needs of the poor and oppressed. Isn't that a Jesus quote? It's yeah. easier for a, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. Mm. So they've all got these ethics and there's no question that that religious ethic has inspired many, many progressive people, many, many progressive groups and movements. Even, even recently, I was referencing Hugo Chavez earlier. He identifies as a, as a Catholic which you know, a lot of people will probably problematize because mm -hmm. Catholicism is a religion that was that was imported and forced on the native population of the Americas by the Spanish. Nonetheless, what he took out of it was that ethic yeah. of just progressive humanity. Um, I've, I, you know, there, there's obviously that that's driving the uh, that drives Iran that has driven people in in Nicaragua, in Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe also identifies as a Catholic. So there's that, which is a is a essentially positive thing. And there's also the way religion is used to divide and rule. And it's uh, like this term sectarianism, when anyone says the word sectarianism, now we instantly think Shia Sunni. Mm. And, and it instantly feeds into yeah. racism and white mm. supremacy, actually. Yeah. It instantly um, feeds into this idea of, you know, silly brown people, they're always fighting each other. Mm. As an anecdote, I was speaking to this guy I used to work with, he was an Australian, white Australian, and he was complaining about the Lebanese and the Greeks in Australia, in Sydney and Melbourne, because they're always fighting each other. And he said, he said the most ridiculous thing, he said, I don't know what it is about us, you know, Anglo-Saxons, it's just like... We're just like a sort of peaceful people oh, and all these other people. All right. <laughs> and I said to him, cool. I, I gave the most obvious response you could give, which yeah. was like, well, I don't know if the indigenous people of your country would necessarily agree, necessarily agree with that. Yeah. And he said, honest to God, oh, mate, some of my best friends are abos. Oh, <laughs> That's quality. Um, yeah. But yeah, the, there was also sectarianism in Ireland for a very long time. Well, yeah. there's still sectarianism there, but look at how religion has been used to divide people and rule people in the north of Ireland for many, many centuries. Um, look at how it's being used now in, in Syria, in Iraq, how it's been used in Libya to divide people and how people have been manipulated on the basis of someone coming and telling them, this person is your friend, 
because they believe the same, they have the same religious beliefs as you. And this person is your enemy because they don't have the same religious beliefs as you. So we just have to be aware that these divisions can all, they exist. You know, we believe different things and those things can always be used to divide us. And we just have to be totally vigilant uh, about responding to that. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I think many of the points that have said are totally valid. I mean, many people, Malcolm X, obviously religious, Marcus Garvey, mm -hmm. Christian, uh, many people, progressive people have gravitated towards religion or even used religion, even if they themselves were not necessarily actually yeah. religious. Yeah. Yeah. They've used religion as a tool, knowing that our people are religious. So I think yeah. spirituality, absolutely. And I think there are problematics that we also have to deal with from a pan-Africanist perspective. We cannot avoid the history of Islamic imperialism because it's inconvenient. At the same time, yeah. we cannot feed into yeah. the British media using Islam to justify bombing little brown kids who may or may not be Muslim, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, little, and children in Africa who will all be black or brown or whatever else. So there's a complicated dichotomy. When we talk about religion being a problem, if we're honest, there's only one religion that the world is saying is a problem, mm -hmm. right? Or the dominant media is saying is a problem. When, when middle-aged European men who are Christian, who are priests sometimes, mm -hmm. rape little children, no one says they did it because of their religion. Mm -hmm. yeah. You understand? Even when when Uganda in Africa is being demonized for being for these homophobic laws, no one's saying, well, they're doing it because they're Christian, which yeah. is their justification. That's they're right. saying, yeah. we hate gays because that's what the Bible says. In Jamaica, same thing. Yeah. When Shabba Ranks was asked why, he's, uh, um, why he hates gay people, he said, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Yeah. That's what he said. <laughs> but no one said Shabba Ranks is homophobic because, because he's Christian. Christian. Do you understand? So mm. there's, there's a thin line and, a, 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 for me, a very difficult, particular movement building uh, <laughs> conversation we need to have, an analogy we need to have, about different religions and the role they play in the world, particularly the three Abrahamic faiths. Mm. And from a Pan-Africanist perspective, I think returning to forms of African-centered spirituality is part of the Pan-African revolution, even in Africa where yeah. Christianity and you know, Islam may be the dominant religions. I think that's where we need to head, right? How does that intersect with people, many people that we even consider revolutionary, who also have politically at times in their career leaned towards Islamic hegemony and mm. things of that nature, right? Mm. So there's very complicated dialogues around religion that need to be had, but I think spirituality and a belief in something b bigger than ourselves is central to whether or not we, we go to the church to do so. It's, it's central to that willingness to give our life for other human beings, I, I think. But Thank you. I'm so sorry. I can't take any more questions. Um, it's past, uh, you know, uh, 5.30. Uh, thank you so much for all your contributions. Um, the Malcolm X movement since like last October has been running uh, the Asata Tupac Liberation School, the only liberation school free and open to all in this country, and will be starting a new curriculum hosted in central London from this October. It will be a unique course that will see some of our best revolutionary scholars impart their knowledge as to the histories of revolutionary movements and countries of the glab uh, global south. So please leave your names so we can send you more of that um, information. Now, uh, Akala, I'll invite you for your performance, please. Cool, safe. Thank you. I I'm, I'm gonna just move to here. I yeah, that's fine. Time now. No problem. Yeah, we right. we passed that time actually. Um, I'm going to share two acapellas with you guys. I, I hope you don't feel bad, but I'm going to stand in front of you. That's absolutely fine. Please do. Please do. Is that all right? Yeah. I'm I'm going to. The oh, yeah. Are you not finished? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Round of applause. <laughs>